Hi, welcome to the next episode of The Pet Factor. I'm Dr. Jim Hosek. And I'm Brittany. And this week, Brittany, we're going to be talking about elbow and hip dysplasia. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to group these together because they're both very similar diseases. They Some of the treatments overlap. And then we're going to talk, because there's so much, we're going to talk about the treatment next time. Yeah. But today we're going to talk mainly about what it is and how we diagnose it. Okay. So I'm going to start with the hip dysplasia. Hip dysplasia is a malformation in the hip joints usually caused by a shallow part of the acetabulum, that's the cup part of the joint, mm-hmm. or a malformation of the femoral head, which is the ball part of the joint. So the hip joint's a ball and socket joint. So right. there's a ball that fits into the socket that gives it a lot of different degrees of range of motion. Mm-hmm. When they have the hip dysplasia, when they're pushing down on, on the hip, the hip tends to pop out of the socket going up right. and slides out. And because of that, they get chronic arthritis and osteophytes, which are little bone spurs that form around the joint and can start to cause them quite a bit of pain. Elbow dysplasia is actually a a complex of at least four different syndromes that Mm. are recognized. And they're caused by a lot of different factors, but primarily most of them are um, inability of the bones to grow at the same rate. So on the foreleg of the dog is the same as our forearms. Basically, they're walking on four legs. They don't have the back legs and front legs aren't the same. The front legs have a radius and ulna uh, in the lower part. And those bones, if they're not growing at the right right rates, they can put pressure on the elbow joint. And uh, it can also put pressure on the uh, the ulna itself in one particular space. Hmm. The most uh, one of the more common things we see is called the ununited ankyneal process, or UAP. Sounds very fancy, <laughs> but the ankyneal process is a little hook on the top of the ulna that hooks around the radius or the humerus, which comes from the upper part of the leg, and it allows the the elbow to not luxate or pull apart. Okay. If the bone, too much pressure on that, that growth plate between that little uh, hook and the rest of the ulna will not heal and it'll just break off in the Ooh. joint. Okay. So that's one of the things that we'll see. The other is a condition called OCD. It's not obsessive <laughs> compulsive disorder. This is osteochondritis desiccans. Okay. And this is a problem that happens where the, uh, the bone at the end of the joint where the cartilage is does not form properly and the cartilage actually forms a flap. Hmm. It gets loose in the joint. And that flap can cause a lot of problems. This usually happens on the uh, medial side of the humerus, the upper part, the upper bone in the upper leg. And there's a, just a little flap that goes in there. And it's aggravated by just mechanical stress, walking around doing normal dog things. Hmm. The next part uh, that we see occurs on the radius. This is the other bone in the lower part of the upper of the front leg. And it's called the fragmented medial coronary process, or FMCP for short. <laughs> And this is often caused because of uh, a discongruity of the growth between the radius and the ulna causing uh, this little process on the side of the bone to break off. It causes a lot of pain and inflammation and arthritis in that joint. And that's just from doing regular dog stuff too? Right. I mean, it, it's, it's a problem because and the, just the pressure of the bones not growing at the right speed will do this. Hmm. So if you get the uh, radius growing faster than the ulna or the ulna growing faster than the radius, then that can be associated oh, okay. with that. okay. And that... This is the, one of the just general uh, things we see is elbow joint incongruity. So when we look at the x-ray, we can see, hey, the top of the ulna and the articular surface of the, the radius are just not matching up. Hmm. So one might be higher than the other. Usually that occurs on the inside part of the leg, what we call the medial side. Okay. And it's so associated with medial compartment uh, disorder or disease. And basically that just causes abnormal wear and erosion of the cartilage, just like we see in the hip where we got the hip subluxating or, or luxating. And you can actually get a subluxation of the humerus and the ulna where that little part hooks over. Okay. And the joint congruity is oftentimes associated with that ununated ankyneal process, the UAP, or the fragmented medial coronary process, hmm. the FMCP. So I'm hearing a lot, um, you know, just not growing right or whatever. So is a lot of this, you know, from puppies, certain breeds, or? Yeah, there's going to be um, a lot of the large and giant breed dogs are the ones most affected. Okay. Especially with the elbow dysplasia. Mm-hmm. It is genetic. There yeah. is a hereditary component to this that's going to be a factor. But there are some nutritional factors that are important as well. A few years ago, they came out with the uh, large breed dog foods as a way to help bital hip dysplasia. Oh, okay. So the, the dogs we see it most often in are going to be your German Shepherds. Okay. Rottweilers, Labrador Retrievers, Golden Retrievers, Mastiffs. Yes, okay. But I've seen hip dysplasia in almost every breed of dog. I've yeah. seen it in little tiny dogs. I've mm-hmm. seen it in Cocker Spaniels. I've seen it in 
um, Yorkies. I know I've seen it in uh, French Bulldogs before. Right. Yeah. Bulldogs are probably another breed that are associated with that. I've even seen it in cats. Oh. So cats are not immune from this condition. It happens in people as well. Hip dysplasia is not uh, unheard of in people. Hmm. Um, we're going to, when we're doing our physical exam, is how we're going to identify if this is a problem with them. And usually the people are coming in because the animal is limping or having problems, mm -hmm. but sometimes yeah. not. Sometimes I've diagnosed hip dysplasia on animals just during their annual exam huh. by feeling for this luxation or uh, looseness in the joint. So with hip dysplasia, oftentimes you'll notice when they're walking or running, they may have a swaying gait where their butt moves from side to side, yeah. or they may bunny hop where they move both back legs going together. Okay. Oftentimes see that, especially going up and down stairs. Yeah. So they can't put pressure on one of the hips, so they're just pushing up with both of them at the same time. If it's just affecting one hip more than the other, they may actually not be using one of the legs. They may just be holding it up it and trying to walk around like that because it's just too painful for them. There's a lot less pain doing it uh, that way. When I'm examining them, we're going to do what's called a range of motion. So mm -hmm. we'll take the, the, grab the knee and stretch the leg straight back. It should stretch back 90 degrees in a normal joint. And then we're going to do what's called abduction where we're going to take the knee and while they're standing and bring it out to the side. So right. now the leg's pointing out uh, to the side of the animal. And that should be able to go up about 90 degrees as well. So on these dysplastic dogs, we're going to have decreased range of motion, sometimes pain associated with that, mm -hmm. where they may actually try and snap at you and let you know that that really hurts. Aww. One of the things I'll do too is when we're doing the abduction, if you kind of lift up on the knee while you're doing that, then the hip will actually come out of the socket. And as you lift it and push it up, it'll clunk back in. Oof. That's called the Ortolani sign. And it can be an audible clunk. You can actually hear it while we're doing it on the exam. Aww. And it's not unusual to see their thigh muscles start to get atrophied because they're not using the back yeah. legs as much. Yeah. The dogs actually carry 60% of their weight on their front legs, 40% in the back. The back's there for pushing off and speed. When we're examining the elbow, Again, we're going to see a decreased range of motion on what's called flexion. So that's taking the paw and bringing it up to their shoulder. Okay. And when we see that, uh, normally they should almost be able to touch their ear when you do that. Oh. But when it, usually I'll get about 50% range of motion in dogs that are having the pain. They also have a uh, thing called a Campbell test. And what we'll do is we'll bring the elbow up just 90 degrees of flexion. And then we're going to twist the paw outwards. So it's called external rotation of the paw. And if they start to have some pain with that, then that can tell us that there's a uh -huh. So that's a more um, sensitive test for checking out the elbow itself. And then you can, by different ranges of motion, you can take that and ex pull them up a little bit more, extend them a little bit more. You can sometimes isolate where in the joint that pain is coming from. Okay. Whether it's an ununited ankylial process or a fragmented medial coronary process. A lot of times we'll see these dogs may swing their front leg out when they're walking because they don't want to bend that elbow. Yeah. So it's okay. easier to swing it out to the side instead of lifting it up. Lifting and bending it, and yeah. It down. Or again, not putting weight on that leg at all, especially if one's more affected than the other. It's oftentimes bilateral disease. We see it in both hips and both elbows. The other thing that we're going to do if we suspect a dog with joint problems is x-rays. Yeah. We want to x-ray, in the case of the hips, we're going to do a pelvic view of them laying on their back, mm -hmm. their legs straight back as far as we can get. Sometimes we need to sedate them to do it because they're too painful yeah. to get in there and do that. Especially those big dogs. <laughs> right. And so what we're looking for is signs of degenerative joint disease. So we might see some arthritis forming, the osteophytes, the little bone spurs around the joint. Mm -hmm. uh, we can see um, changes in the bones themselves. So the femoral neck, the part between the ball part of the joint and the rest of the bone is a little thin neck. That can get thickened. And the ball part sometimes starts to look square. Uh, yeah. We can also see decreased coverage of the acetabulum over that femoral head. Mm. So the acetabulum is the cup part of the joint that we talked about. Normally should cover about half that femoral head, that right. ball part. And in hip dysplasia, it may only cover 25 or 30%, or mm -hmm. it may actually be totally luxated out of the joint. So the femoral head is not even in near the, the cup part. It's just floating out there. Yeah. We can also see uh, sclerosis of the bone, so a little bit of thickening of the bone around the, the cut part and in the femoral uh, neck as well. So those are very distinct. Sometimes it can be one side, sometimes it's both sides. There's a um, screening radiograph called a um, 
OFA certification or OFA radiographs. These, the dogs have to be at least two years of age, and then those are sent off and they're evaluated by a panel of radiologists who oh. grade it, and then the breeders will use that to, to help determine if the dogs uh -huh. have problems passing it on. Okay. The big problem with that is it's not very accurate until at least two years of age, and even then, you can sometimes miss some dogs. Okay. So there's another process is uh, developed at the University of Pennsylvania called a pen hip. Hmm. And what we do with that is called a distracted view, um, uh, where we actually, instead of pulling the leg straight back, the knees are pointing straight up in the air. And we put this hip distractor device between the thighs and push the knees together. Huh. And then we're able to measure how far the ball part of the, the socket joint comes out from normal position. Huh. So you take a measurement where you measure, draw a circle around where the acetabulum or cup part would be, and then you draw another circle where the femoral head is, okay. and you measure the distance um, of they are apart compared to the radius of the, of the smaller circle. Hmm. And you can get a ratio, and that ratio can give you a very good indication whether they're gonna develop hip dysplasia as young as four months of age. Wow. So if you've got some dogs and you wanna decide which ones you're keeping from breeding, the pen hip yeah. is gonna be the best way to go. Ah. That's something that's really neat. Not a lot of vets are certified in it. There's a certification process that you have to go through. But I think it's a much more valuable test for screening for hip dysplasia. Because we've been doing OFA for years and years and we still haven't seen that much of a decrease in the incidence yeah, of hip well. dysplasia. Um, with the elbows, um, x-rays are a good screening tool as well but they have some limitations because they don't pick up every case of elbow dysplasia. So we're gonna get some special views on that. We're gonna do what's called a cranial caudal view where we're taking an x-ray right through the front of the elbow um, as you're facing the dog. So we're putting our uh, legs pulled out in front of them on the table, mm -hmm. gonna pull their head back <laughs> so we can, <laughs> that doesn't get in the way. And then we'll get an x-ray that. And that helps us to identify the fragmented medial coronoid process. That's gonna be pretty obvious on that. And sometimes we can see the OCD lesions on that view as well, okay. where the uh, humeral, uh, there could be a defect in the, the medial uh, humeral condyle for the humerus there. I'm throwing out all these technical terms, but hopefully I'm trying to explain that that's the upper part <laughs> of the arm, medial is the inside, mm -hmm. so we'll see a defect, a little black area where that bone is. You oftentimes see the flap of cartilage, because cartilage just doesn't show up on x-ray. But um, sometimes we see OCD in the shoulder joint too, sometimes we do see that flap yeah. in there. We're also gonna do a lateral view where they're laying on their side. And we're gonna do two views of that, one with the elbow in extension, so holding it straight yeah. out. Mm -hmm. And that's gonna help us look for joint incongruity. So looking at differences in the length of the radius and the ulna and how the joints match up with the humerus. And then we're gonna do a flexed view. So we're gonna bend that elbow as far as we can. Usually it's gonna be you know, about 75 degrees or so, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, over 90 degrees, so about 135 degrees. And then that's gonna let us see the anconeal process of the, hu of the hu um, ulna. So that little process that sometimes becomes uh, loose. And in, when they're extended, you can't see it, it's hidden inside the humerus. No. But when you flex it, it becomes obvious, you can see the whole uh, ulna or bone there, joint mm. part of the joint, and you can see that. So if that's not attached, that'll be very obvious in that view. In some cases, you end up having to go to do a CT scan to evaluate yeah. the elbows, and that can be much more sensitive at picking these things up. They, they'll compare both legs together, and they don't have to be flexed or anything like that. Arthroscopy is another tool that we'll use, and a lot of orthopedic specialists will go in if they're suspecting elbow dysplasia, especially with the, the OCD lesions, because they can go in and remove that piece of cartilage at that same time without doing major surgery. Hmm, cool. So those are the, the big things we're looking at. Physical exam and x-rays are going to be our major tools for doing that, as well as what type of dog they are. Mm -hmm. If we get a German Shepherd coming in limping, we're going to be thinking that as well. <laughs> so next time we're going to talk about the treatments that are available for both these diseases, and they range from supplements to surgeries, as well as a bunch of alternative therapies that are now available and that we've been using. So tune in next time, and we're going to have more information there. But Hopefully this kind of gives you some idea of what to look for in your dog if uh, mm -hmm. you're suspecting hip dysplasia. Like I said, it doesn't have to be a German Shepherd, doesn't mm -hmm. have to be a Rottweiler, it could be anybody that's having those problems. And some of the things we distinguish hip dysplasia from, uh, you can think of a thing called leg perthes disease where there's a uh, degeneration of the hip joint where the femoral head actually starts to die off. Oh. And that can present with similar symptoms, we'll diagnose that on x-rays. We can also see trauma related to it. So yeah. fractures in the hips can present as that same sort of symptoms, the hip pain, but we go in and we see there's actually a break in the bone. Mm. So it's important we distinguish those things from there. All right, 
We're ready to move on to pet health news. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> All right. This uh, first story it regards feline retroviruses. And okay. the feline retroviruses are the feline leukemia virus and FIV virus. Mm-hmm. So the American Association of Feline Practitioners, we, AAFP, uh, they put out a guideline for that about 12 years ago. So they've updated that as of January. Okay. So this is kind of exciting. They published that in the Journal of Feline Medicine and Surgery. And this is to help uh, veterinary professionals get the most accurate and up-to-date information on these infections. Um, the panel felt that although the guidelines for the prevention of infection have been available for decades, there remains a need to improve compliance with the testing and vaccine recommendations. And I'm seeing that a lot with the kittens. A lot yeah. of these kittens are not getting their feline leukemia vaccines. Mm-hmm. And the cats that are most uh, susceptible to it are the cats less than a year of age. Yeah. So if your veterinarian is not doing a feline leukemia vaccine, make sure you ask about them. Ask them to check out the AAFP guidelines, and they're going to give them the ideal ideas the guidelines on that. So there's a good deal of new information on the feline leukemia virus and the FIV viruses in the guidelines. And so we're going to be reviewing those with our staff and making sure we get up to date on that and make any changes to our protocols. So the current reports say about 3 to 5% of tested cats in North America are infected with FIV. Oh. So that's a lot. That's almost 1 in 20. Mm-hmm. And more common in male cats that tend to get into fights, which yeah. kind of makes sense because it's spread primarily by bite wounds. And it's going to be primarily in cats over a year of age. We talked about this when we did the vaccines, but mm-hmm. mainly uh, seen less frequently in the kittens and the neutered adults. Uh, there are, is no vaccine for FIV. Yeah. So uh, in order to protect the cats, it's basically keeping them in, inside, mm-hmm. keeping them from getting into the fights. Um, so, and then making sure if you do have a cat, you're aware of it, making sure they're tested. A lot of uh, shelters are not testing for FIV. They're just yeah. testing for feline leukemia. So it's really important that your vet does that screening when you adopt a new cat if they haven't been uh, tested. Uh, they don't usually get it from their mother. And again, it's usually going to be the older cats. If you're adopting an older cat, it's going to be more important. But we do test the younger cats as well. The feline, immu- uh, feline leukemia infection rates are very similar, about 4%, about 1 in 25 cats okay. are found to be infected. Um, there are vaccines that protect the cats readily available. Mm-hmm. Uh, as we mentioned before, we only recommend the recombinant vaccine because there has been indications that the non-recombinant vaccines are associated with tumors at the vaccination site. And then the protocols are indicating that it be administered to all kittens uh, at a year of age and then a booster a year later, and then for cats that have ongo- and, and a year later for cats that have ongoing risk, and every year after that. Right. Okay, so the the document, this guidelines are addressing the rapidly evolving knowledge about how the testing results, clinical expression, and prognosis for feline leukemia can change over time, to the cat's current immune response and resulting levels of virus in circulation, mm-hmm. and so how quantitative testing may be used to better inform clinical decision making and a trend which screening for feline leukemia and FIV is shifting from the animal shelters. From, from where the cats are adopted to the veterinary practitioners where they receive their comprehensive care. So these quantitative testing for the feline leukemia virus, right now we can tell if they have it yes or no, but these new tests are going to be able to tell us how much virus is circulating. And their virus level loads can then help us in terms of managing the patient and giving people uh-huh. diagnosis. So that's kind of a neat thing that's going to be available. Yeah. Uh, there's also bro- a client brochure that comes with this, so we're going to make sure we get that for um, people that just informs pet owners regarding the transmission, the testing, the prevalence, the precautions they should be taking. Okay. And the, the AAFP, they just want to stress the partnership between the veterinarians and the cat owners and caring for the infected cats uh, because with regular health care and reduced stress, these cats with the retroviruses, especially the FIV, live many healthy years. Yeah. A lot of times you don't diagnose these cats till 10, 12 years after after they've been infected because mm-hmm. there's just no reason to check them until they start getting sick. So um, hmm. that's something all veterinarians will be checking out new uh, coming out. And it's nice that the AAFP is re- evaluating those things and giving us those guidelines. Yeah. Okay, Brittany, what, the, what do you have there? All right. So Alaska Airlines um, is offering flight training for guide dogs for the blind. So they're going to teach these dogs to fly the planes for their blind owners? Yes. <laughs> No. Oh. Um, so while the debate over emotional support animals, um, plane rages on. Um, one airline is working to help service dog get the experience they need to become expert travelers for them. Um, so to help the owners with them, yeah. yeah. Um, Alaskan Airlines um, has partnered with Guide Dogs for the Blind, so GDB, um, to host their sixth annual free event to help service dogs get accumulated with various aspects of airplane travel. Okay. 
Um, so during the event, guide dogs, you know, mostly puppies in training, um, and then people with disab uh, disabilities, including the visually impaired, hearing impaired, um, and those in wheelchairs uh, are able to explore mock airplane travels. Um, and then they learn various safety measures and how to control, you know, in controlled environments. Okay, so the dogs can get on the plane without getting on the plane. Mm -hmm. So when they first get on the plane, they're not freaked out by anything. Mm -hmm. They're not worried about the pressure and things like that. Um, attendees were able to sit on airplane seats and let the dogs get familiar with the cabin. Right. Um, they learn about the safety measures, including emergency landing and exit roll pr uh, procedures, um, as well as volunteering uh, Alaskan Airlines flight attendants and pilots to walk them through operations and then answer questions for them as well. That's really nice. Mm -hmm. that, I, that, that, all the airlines should be doing this for the, them. I feel like every airline should do this because there are always emotional support animals on these no, planes. Well, these, are, these are the working dogs. So these are the ones that really should be on the planes with their owners because mm -hmm. they can't can't travel without them. Yes. Emotional support animals like the ducks and the yeah. hedgehogs. And but all these that. are more so for like for the blind right. um, to help them get through where they need to be. Yeah. Um, so community outreach specialist for the GDB um, help organize to attend his own guide dog oh. on these things. So he has a, so he's blind and he has yes. his own guide dog. So. Yes. Yeah, so it's help, and, he's helping, you know, get this word out there for them. Um, he released a statement stating, you know, something like this where you can actually feel everything increases safety, makes it less physical, and makes people feel more comfortable with flying. And, you know, and that's saying a lot for him because... Because if the people are stressed, the dogs are going to be stressed, too, because mm -hmm. they pick it up from the owners. Yep. Um, but it was nice to hear that the airline and these organizations are working to make it less overwhelming for the visually impaired and their service animals. So That's awesome. they're doing great. So we got to follow after Alaska. Yeah. They're doing good. So, I mean, it'd be nice, even if you don't fly Alaska Airlines, at least take advantage of this when they offer it. Mm -hmm. And um, then when you do travel another airline, it's going to be a similar experience for the dogs. Yeah. All right. This last story was interesting and again this seems like a sort of a, a no-brainer but they wanted to do a study to find out if punitive training makes dogs pessimistic okay okay so there's two training methods you could reward them or you could punish them right all right and some training schools really believe that the punitive training is more effective mm -hmm. so these researchers they did a review of literature and they just couldn't find anything showing that if any studies showing that it if that was causing long-term problems to the welfare of the dogs so a lot of these previous studies had relied on surveys from the owners. They were only uh, looked at particular methods like shock collars mm -hmm. to the exclusion of others. They only examined short-term effects while uh, not like looking at long-term effects. So they basically designed this long-term study where they wanted to evaluate um, the effects of the training on the dogs in terms of their stress levels and whether or not they became pessimistic. Okay. So it's really cool how they did this. So they recruited 92 dogs all around two years of old from okay. three uh, punishment-based avert or call aversive groups. Um, so they go to schools, uh, dog training schools that have this thing, okay. and then four reward-based dog training schools. Okay. Uh, and uh, and this was actually done in Portugal. So to evaluate the short-term welfare, they did video recordings of three training sessions and six saliva samples. One, oh. uh, three post-training, and three at-home baseline collections. And you can actually measure cortisol levels from saliva. So that's something they do quite often in Europe. I know you said um, before we said it was uh, through the hair as well. Right. Oh, that's so you do it through the hair. Yeah. The videos they were analyzing frequency of stress-related behavior such as crouching and yawning. Okay. All right. So those are going to let them know. The dogs were then trained to, to do the pessimism thing. They were trained to associate one side of the room with a bowl containing a sausage treat. That's the positive. Okay. And the other side of the room with an empty bowl, which is negative. Okay. So they go to the empty bowl, they're not getting anything. They go to the, the positive bowl, they're getting something. So that's uh, they're optimistic there's going to be something in there. Okay. So then what they would do is they would take an empty bowl and put it either near the positive bowl or the negative bowl or in between them. And they would see how long it took the dog to go to that bowl. Huh. So obviously they know one side is where the treat is, they might go to that bowl quicker. Right. If there's no treat there, they may not do. And in the middle of the room, they might, they huh. might uh, kind of guess, well, I don't know. I know it's going to be over there. And over there it's not. So that's how they're kind of measuring this. <laughs> so it's really kind of an interesting thing there. So that's how they were, were able to evaluate those things. So they, huh. they, they hypothesized that the speed that they went to the bowl would negatively correlate with the animal's degree of pessimism. <laughs> so this, is, okay. this is what they found. Um, in the short-term welfare indicators uh, for negative behavior and elevated cortisol levels were more prevalent in the aversive group. So okay. definitely they were more stressed 
and they're showing this not only with their behavior but with changes in their biochemistry. Right. They found a strong relationship between the number of stress-related behaviors and the number of aversive stimuli used in the training school. Okay. So the more punishment they received, the more stress they, they did. Get. So that's yep. kind of pretty obvious. Um, when they looked at and this, they did that with not only behavior but the cortisol levels as well, the same thing. The more aversive be, uh, behaviors they did, the more uh, elevation in the cortisol levels. In the long-term welfare testing, which is the, the bowls, they did see a very significant difference with the centrally in place bowls. So they didn't see a difference in the bowls that were near the positive or negative. <laughs> but when they put in the middle, the diversion groups took longer to approach the bowl okay. um, than those from that yeah, the reward group. And so they think that this is a, uh, a correlation between long-term um, stress causing pessimism in these dogs and that they, they get a lot of punishment. They're not going to assume that there's a treat in the bowl. They're just going to assume there's not and a there's treat in the bowl. There's nothing in there, right? Which is really very interesting. <laughs> So um, basically, they, they uh, exhibited the decision-making that modeled a more pessimistic mindset when they had this aversion training. And the higher the frequency of the punishments used in the training, the greater the impact on the overall welfare of the dogs. Okay. So they basically said if reward-based training methods are better for canine welfare than aversive methods, dog owners and, handler, and handlers should integrate more of this methodology in the training, which just makes a lot of common sense. Yeah. I know there's a lot of trainers that feel that this aversive thing is, but... They're not seeing a dog for the rest of their life. So yeah. They're not seeing these long-term effects. So mm -hmm. it's just kind of these things that seem like they're common sense, but they're actually come up with these studies to measure things and to determine that dog can be pessimistic yeah, is really very yeah. interesting. All right. I think we're ready to move on to our case of the week. Yes. And <laughs> today's case is Rosie. Yes. Rosie is a six-month little Boston that came in the other day, mm -hmm. and since they've had Rosie, Rosie has had a tough time breathing through her nose. Yes. So she has a condition called stenotic nares, which basically means her nostrils are smaller or narrower than they should Need normally be. be. Yeah. It's a very common thing that's found in the brachycephalic dogs, or the dogs with these kind of pushed-in faces, mm -hmm. like your Bostons, your Bulldogs. Your Pugs. Pugs, all those dogs that, you know, as opposed to the normal nice snout. And it, it's associated with not only these uh, narrow uh, nostrils or stenotic narrowings, but they can have elongation of their soft palate okay. in the back of their mouth. And they can have changes in their pharynx, the, the part between the, the esophagus and the larynx there, where they get these things called everted saccules or little tissue things that come in and it can interfere with the airflow back there too. Mm. So we're hoping, uh, she's coming in for her spay uh, later this week, so we're going to hopefully be able to open up those nostrils and we'll get a better look in the back of our mouth. When you look in these dogs' mouths when they're in the exam, you can't see the back of their throat. Right. Their tongue is so big, so they have to be anesthetized and we'll look back there to a laryngoscope. If they need more procedures, we'll let them know. Mm -hmm. That's usually done best with a laser um, to, because there's a lot of bleeding with those and with somebody who knows exactly how much tissue to take off. Stenotic right. nary is a fairly routine procedure for a lot of these little dogs, and uh, if that's all she needs, then that should make her life a lot better. Mm. So if you have one of these dogs and they seem to be having a tough time breathing, breathing with their mouth open, they get tired very easily, talk to your vet about getting that done. Uh, a lot of times people who have these dogs and had them, they already know this. Yeah. They already have a surgeon that they work with that goes <laughs> with it. But if it's a new breed for you, um, definitely check out and ask your vet if that's going to be something they're going to need. Yeah. All right. All right, tech tips. Yes. So you were mentioning to me that you had a question the other day if someone had just adopted an older dog. Well, actually, it was a, um, someone who had an older dog. This is an older gentleman. Okay. This is his first dog ever having, and it was a 16-year-old shepherd. Wow. Yes. <laughs> so um, adopting a 16-year-old shepherd, you're, you're really doing a nice thing. Yes. No one's going to adopt these dogs. No. <laughs> but they do have a, quite a bit of different experience than just adopting a puppy or a mm -hmm. younger dog, right? Yes. Um, so the owner asked me because he w went to tell takes his dog outside and he was like you know she doesn't seem to be wanting to go outside as much as she had earlier in the year um and I was like well you know there could be a lot of things going on with her and most people don't think senior dogs especially at 16 most people don't think 16 is a senior for dogs because they think of like people 16 you're in your prime you're happy you're active that's actually like an 80 year old person <laughs> for, for a dog that's an 80 year old person they're tired they have arthritis it's cold they just want to watch judge judy uh-huh right? and they just yeah. want to sit in their bed and relax in their <laughs> comfy pants um and so i had to explain to the owner that you know at her age she could have arthritis right. and so i did speak to the owner about possibly getting a doctor's appointment because she's not on any type of joint supplement supplements or fish oils or things like or that nothing wow 
Um, so I talked to dad about starting up an appointment with her, but I was like, you know, if it's cold, her, she may have painful joints. I asked him about going up and down stairs. How is she doing with that? And he said, you know, the other day she slipped on a stair. And I was like, that could be one reason why she doesn't want to go outside. Yeah. She hurt herself. And, you know, those stairs are slippery now. And I was like, you know, for older dogs, you do have to watch, you know, the tile floor, linoleum, right. wood, because they're not as sturdy as a two-year-old puppy would be um so i talked to dad about like maybe putting something rugs down or something because right. while she was here she only right. wanted to stand on our rug she did not want to touch our tile floor which made sense because as soon as she touched it she started slipping again makes sense she's got i think she has really painful hips yeah. um but makes a lot of sense and then i kind of explained to dad too again first dog it's a senior dog he was not prepared for these things um looking at her eyes they're starting to get pearly she's got cataracts and it's nice. like you know taking her outside you know seeing when she's more reluctant during the daytime or during nighttime right um he said he hadn't really thought about it but for people you have to think if a dog can't really see at night they're going to be more reluctant to be active at nighttime um, okay, so I had talked to owner about may, maybe leaving on a nightlight for her, or um, they do have a lot of uh, doggy flashlight things that you can attach to their mm -hmm. leash or to the dogs to help give them a little extra light, right. um, just to see if her exercise uh, reluctance was because she can't see as well. Yeah. Um, and One thing I recommend for people with stairs is to put some contrasting tape on the edge of the stairs. Mm -hmm. So, so it makes more it easier for to see. Them. Cause yeah. they just see a gray slide going down a ramp and they get a little freaked out. Yeah. Um, so a lot of it, you know, it was it was kind of cute because he was a little older man with a really old dog. And I was really happy that this dog had adopted. Right. Um, but a lot of things, you know, people, you know, don't think about it. Or this is their first time having a dog. You've had her for 13, 14 years. And then you start noticing changes in her life that, you know, you don't think about. Um, but that was one of the ones that kind of stood out to me because I was yeah. like, Again, most people adopt a senior dog and they don't think about it. Um, but, again, I'm hoping that he makes an appointment so we can just ha have her checked out because I think she definitely needs some pain right. medication for her hips um, and some joint supplements. But it was just something simple that stood out to me. And, and, and you know, an older dog is going to match better with an older person because mm -hmm. they're less active as well. Uh, and there's just the personalities are there and the uh, activity levels match up perfectly. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, if you are thinking of adopting an older dog, definitely make sure you get them checked out. Yeah. And don't assume that uh, because they're just, they look, they don't look that old that they don't have problems. Yeah. Well, and then just make sure you do your research too, because I know a lot of people get older dogs because they don't want to do potty training or things like mm -hmm. that. But a lot of these older pets, when they do get rehomed, they too tend to get stress UTIs um, and we have seen dogs you know get adopted and almost rehomed so again for that infection mm -hmm. for people who don't understand their vet yeah or you have dogs that are especially the females incontinent yeah. um, they get it sometimes after spaying which is okay um, but just you know don't think to rehome her after you already brought her home because of it right. um, and then you know just Dogs with their eyes, you know, they may look clean to you, but you bring your dog to the vet and you'd be like, oh, yeah. we have some cataracts starting. That's why they're bumping into things. Right. Or that's why they're not trying to catch a treat or mm -hmm. do some go as long for walks or things like that. There are the things that can be easily corrected, but it's just things you wouldn't think of with a younger dog. Mm -hmm. So it's just a lot of, you know, planning for yeah. a senior dog. It's almost as much work as for a puppy. Um but it's, the end of life, but yeah, yeah, but it's still as rewarding. And again, I'm so happy that he adopted her. Yeah. Sixteen year old shepherd in the in the rescue. I'm happy she's a hot at home. Okay. Um, those are some great tips. And uh, next week, we, like I said, we're going to finish up part two on our elbow and hip dysplasia. Mm -hmm. And then also check us out on Groundhog's Day. We've got our Groundhog's Day <laughs> special coming up. So yes. be sure to listen to that. And um, as always, remember subscribe and follow us. Mm -hmm. So if you're watching us on YouTube, I think the, the button's beneath. Somewhere. But Brittany, if you're following us on a podcast or listening to us on podcast, make sure you follow so you get every episode as soon as they're available. Yep. All right, that's it for this week. I'm Dr. Jim Hosek. And I'm Brittany. Bye. Bye.